about the wisdom of men and being spiritual people. And by the grace of God, he now allows us to understand how to grow as spiritual people. What it takes to be that which he says is pleasing to him. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to go through the various parts that help us to be spiritual people, as opposed to being infants in Christ. And I submit to you that after this is my sincere hope that you don't want to be an infant in Christ. You don't want to be an infant in in Christ. Let us begin in the first verse. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. So to begin, it's likening those who are men of the flesh, and that men is not just males, that's that's human. People, a person, people of flesh, as to infants in Christ. So those two, you can consider the same thing. But what is an infant in Christ? Well, first of all, it is a person of flesh. And notice some characteristics of this infant, of this person of flesh. They could not be spoken to with the spiritual things, the spiritual words. And so, in order to help understand this, let's create uh, an image in your mind. So, put on one side, men of flesh, infants in Christ. On the other side, put spiritual, God. And let's go backward in the text for a moment, where we were in the last lesson that I was uh, privileged to serve you in giving. It says... Verse 14 of chapter 2. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Okay, so the natural man, again, they, they won't accept the things of the Spirit. Well, the fleshly person, well, you couldn't, you couldn't speak to him because... They are not going to, well, the text says, could not speak to you because uh, you are men of flesh. And so the natural man can be put on the side of the, the fleshly man and the infant in Christ. And then the spiritual can be placed over here. So it's the same, the same category. The natural man, the fleshly man, and the infant in Christ. Same side. And so then, if the natural man couldn't receive the things of the Spirit, the fleshly man obviously couldn't receive the things of the Spirit, then you can fill in the gaps with the rest of what the natural man is. In the context, looking backwards in chapter 2, the natural man is one who looks at the things of the world. The natural man is the one who they take on and accept the human wisdom, the wisdom of men. Because they all fit in this one category here on this side. So then going back forward, we can say that the men of flesh the infant, and the natural man are all in the same category, not accepting the things of God, not accepting the Spirit of God. Verse 2 of chapter 3. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. So by way of uh, illustration, the text says that those who are fleshly infants in Christ have this more 
natural man way of thinking, they can only receive milk. Those who are spiritual, because it says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. And what did he not do? He says, and brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual men. So the solid food is equal to the spiritual things, the spiritual words. For you are still fleshly. Now I want to note something here before we move on. Notice where these fleshly, natural man type thinking people are. They're in Christ. They're still in him. So they are in the body of Christ. But they have this fleshly, natural, humanistic way of thinking. And that's why they're infants. That's why they don't... Well, we'll see. Look at some more characteristics of this fleshly, natural way of thinking of those who are in Christ. For are you, for you are still fleshly. For, since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? So there's your characteristics of someone who is going to be more of this, again, human wisdom. It's going to cause jealousy. It's going to cause striving, this, this sharp disagreements with each other. That's what it brings about. That's the characteristics of these people who are infants in Christ. People that may be sitting in the pews right next to you. I'm not saying anything about anyone here, just to note. But that's those characteristics. You're going to be disagreeing and there's going to be jealousy among you. And you're, they're walking as just mere men. And this relates back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 11. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. What is, what's a quarrel? Strife? Sharp disagreements? He's going to go into this again. Verse 4, chapter 3. For when one says, I am of Paul, or another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Let's pause here for a moment and reflect on this. So the Holy Spirit is saying, look, you, through, through, a pot, through the writer here, he's saying, you are fleshly. I can only speak to you as fleshly. Because look at you, you guys are associating yourselves with these men. I am of Paul, I am Apollos. And if you reflect back, you'll, you'll see that this I am of whoever is a type of boasting in men. But then he goes to clarify this situation. He says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So think about that for a moment. He is redirecting their focus. He's saying, okay, you guys want to be uh, associated and, and boasting in, in these men and uh, uh, acting like you're just mere men. What is Paul? What is Apollos? They're just servants through God. Now, specifically, we can look at Paul's case because it says in the text in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So, God, Jesus Christ, sent him. He is serving, he's a servant of God. So, God's 
plan, God's will was to send this man. He's just doing what God wanted him to do. He's nothing. I'm just doing what God wanted me to do. God made me an apostle. It's God's will that I do this. I'm serving God. So he's nothing. It's all God. Verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then you have these two servants of God by the will of God. And what he's saying is, I planted by the will of God. He told me to do it. He watered. Who? Serving God. And God's causing the growth. So God's involved in all of this and controlling all this. So it's like when you have <laughs> a child and their focus is over here on the guy or whatever the case may be. And you kind of turn their head and do that. You're like, focus right here. It's God. No, no focus right here. It's God. It's not men. It's, it's God. He's redirecting them. To focus on God. Look at what God's doing. God sent me. God sent Apollos. God's causing the growth. It's God. It's not the man. But when you want to think about the man, the consequence of you being fleshly and boasting that man, strife, jealousy, fleshly mindset. Verse 7. So then, neither the one who plants, which is Paul in this case, nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. He's the one that told him to plant. He's serving. He's doing all that. He's the one that told him to water. He's serving. And God's causing the growth. So God's in everything. God's the one that's causing the growth every step of the way. It's God. Verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. But each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. How is it that they are one? What is that? What is that? What is that talking about? I submit to you that in this context, if we think back, what did they promote of, for them to do? What did they promote? Chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no division among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so they are one. They're not, they're not two. They're one. Same. United. Same judgment. All agree. They're one. And they're one in the fact that they are serving God. They're just doing what God wants them to do, that one. And it, it even says in 13, has Christ been divided? So let's step back for a moment and look at the big picture here with regard to where I'm trying to lead you. It says, infants in Christ to spiritual people. We can clearly see from the beginning that Paul is calling them infants, fleshly people. They have this certain mentality of the world, and it's causing problems for them. Strife, jealousy. And he says, okay, you guys are boasting in men. You're focusing on the man. You're focusing on that you have this mentality. Now let me shift your focus. I'm going to start saying, focus on God. Yes, I did this, and Paulus did this, but focus on God. Verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Catch that? You catch the figure, did you catch that language, field? What do you do in a field? Well, you plant something, you water something, right? So he's saying them, Apollos and Paul, are those who are planting within these people, and we they are God's field in which God is causing the growth. But it also says that they are God's building. 
They are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. Okay. Well, for the sake of this lesson, I won't go into that but too much, but the grace that was given to him, of course, was him being an apostle and the fact that he preached uh, the crucifixion, cru crucifixion, the Christ crucified. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than that, other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of them being built up, notice the language, building, builder, foundation. The foundation of them in their spirituality is being built up on the foundation of Jesus Christ. This starts the building process of being spiritual. Because didn't he, back in, the, back in the text, he's an apostle. He's one sent with the message by the will of God. The message that he says is, I'm going to build you up with, with the message of Christ crucified. But we preach, verse 23 of chapter 1, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews' stumbling block and to the Gentiles' foolishness. They preach Christ crucified. That's the foundation of spirituality. And that's what they received. They said, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that you may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. You see, the growth is beginning. They receive these spiritual words from God. Verse 10, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. This is starting the spiritual growth process. You can even consider it already starting when you reorient your, your thoughts to seeing how God does the growth. Okay. Verse 12 of chapter 3. Now if any man builds on the foundation, of course, that's Jesus Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. That is known, understood, seen. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. The, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. Let's pause. So he already said that each one is going to receive their reward. Verse 8, right? Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to your labor. And then he says it again. If any man's work which he has built remains, it will receive a reward. So there's a condition. If it remains after it's tested by the fire, right? So then the question may be, what's going to remain? If you were his building, and you're building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, then what's going to remain when it's tested by fire? This is going to require some thinking caps now. Let's look back, chapter 1. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. So, if God is going to destroy the wisdom of the wise, that would be the wisdom of men, right? What's left? The wisdom of God. That's what's going to remain. The wisdom of God. So then, if you're building, if you're found that you're building on that foundation with the wisdom of God, it will remain 
and receive the reward. In other words, if what you build on is the wisdom of God, which is the spirit of God, which is the spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, it will remain. You will receive the reward. However, here's another conditional statement. Verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, because it's the wisdom of men, it's the wisdom of the world, it's fleshly, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Praise God. Praise God for his mercy. So you can be in Christ. You can be an infant, have this fleshly mind, but you'll be saved. You have that foundation of Jesus Christ, but you're going to be tested through this fire. That's the only thing that's going to save you, is you have the foundation of Jesus Christ. Okay, 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. A temple is a building, right? Temple is a building. And so being the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you, which agrees with that other passage saying, we have received the Spirit of God, right? In order to be built with the quality things that remain spiritual thoughts, spiritual words, because the wisdom of man is going away. The wisdom of man is going to be destroyed. You want to grow to be a spiritual person? It's not going to be on the wisdom of men. It's not going to be in their science, their understanding, it's the wisdom of God. Verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. That's a warning, people. That's a warning. If anyone destroys the temple of God, we can go into this later into the class to, to see what this is, is really saying in a different way, but it's, it's, it's getting to the same point. If any man destroys the temple of God, that's human, any human, male, female. And how would you do that? How would you destroy the temple of God? If Knowing that in verse 19, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. If you build someone up on the wisdom of the wise, the wisdom of men, the fleshly way of thinking. If you build someone up, he says, if any man destroys the temple of God, I will destroy him. Because if you build them up in this other wisdom, God's going to destroy that. And so, there, so therefore, you're destroying the temple of God. Now, it says God will destroy him. How is it that God will destroy him? Again, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Okay. Verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. There's another warning. Don't trick yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself. 
Don't make you seem like something is true that's really not. He keeps telling us, if you are going to do this, this is going to happen. And I want to I want to emphasize this, not because it's, it's me trying to overemphasize the point, but I want to connect a dot. Look at the language. It says, if any man dis destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. That's a promise, people. Look at what it says in chapter 1, verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful. You think this is a joke? Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. It will happen. If you believe in the good promises of God, this is good too. Everything's good of God. But this is a, a, a warning for those who are thinking to build someone up in, in the wisdom of humans as opposed to his wisdom. You're going to cause that person to be destroyed. By God's mercy, they'll be saved because they're on the resurrection, grounded in that. And God will destroy you. Rest of verse 18. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Now, how does that make sense? How does that make sense? If you take your mind back to chapter 1, verse tw starting in verse 26. We know, it says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. So if you're not wise, you're not noble, you're not mighty. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame those things that are strong. And the base things, things without nobility. Of the world and the despised things God has chosen, the things that are not, not wise, not mighty, not noble, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. You see? There's no boasting in men. There's no, in other words, pride in men, none in God. No wisdom. That you can boast in of men. None. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. He's driving it home. He's saying it again. For it is written. He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. Verse 20 of chapter 3. And again, the Lord knows the reasoning of the wise. That they are useless. There's no point. It does no good. It's useless. There's nothing. It's vanity. It's empty. So then, let one let no one boast in men. Let no one boast in men. That's human. Let no one have pride in men. None. We can go back to when he said this in a different way. Chapter 1, verse 31. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So you can't boast in men, but he says boast in the Lord. There's no other options. You've got to boast in the Lord. He's, gonna, he's making this very clear. There's no wisdom out there that's going to do anybody any good. In fact, it's going to cause them to be destroyed, and God's going to destroy you. Because you are destroying the temple of God. The only way to be built up into a spiritual person from this infantile mentality, this fleshly mentality, is with God. Because we receive the spirit of God. We have to do this with spiritual words and spiritual thoughts.
Verse 30. But by his doing, you are in... Excuse me. Let me go back. Verse 21 of chapter 3. So then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all things belong to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. He's trying to help you understand that you have everything in God. For all things belong to you. I can summarize this by saying this. This part, that is. Let no one boast of men because all things are God's. If you are in God and God has everything, there's nothing outside of him to boast of. You see? Don't boast in him. All things are God's. All things. It says, if you want to, if you want to drive this home a little bit even more, it says chapter 1, verse 5. In everything you were enriched in him. <laughs> in everything you were enriched in him. In all speech, in all knowledge. And if you didn't get that in everything you were enriched in him. And he says, for all things belong to you. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, the world, life, death, the things in the present, the things to come, all things. How many ways can he say it? All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So everything belongs to God. So in God, you have everything. So there's no reason to boast in men. So I hope this is helpful and edifying because I'm in the same boat for us all to see how we can go from being these infants, these fleshly people, these natural men, that is people, natural people, giving ourselves to the wisdom of the world, building ourselves up in that, trying to build others up in that. We can go from that putting those things aside with the Spirit of God and seeing why we should, because it's going to come to naught, to nothing, that is. And that we best build ourselves up as the temple of God, with God, because all things belong to God.